good morning everyone and uh, good morning for DMC participants, uh, counterparts, donor partners, ADB transport community, academia and private sector. Thank you for joining uh, this uh, virtual Asia and Pacific transport forum this year. Also, thank you for joining this big data session titled Enhancing the role of big data in promoting sustainable development of transport system. Uh, my name is Kijun Kim from ADB, and I will be moderating this session for the next one and a half hours. The main purpose of this session is to make audiences and participants one step closer to the big data. What is the big data? How we can make use of it? What's the benefit of it? So to achieve those, that purpose, we, we invited five very uh, distinguished speakers from uh, different areas. We have uh, Rana Hassan, he's the Director of Economic Analysis and Operation Support Division in ADB. And we have a uh, Kony Huizenga, he's an expert in uh, sustainable and low carbon transport. He was leading uh, Slow Cat and uh, Clean Air Asia. So we have a uh, Dr. Dong Ik Jang from Korea Transport Institute. He is working for the AI and the transport big data team. So we have a, a fifth is a, a Mr. Sri Ganesh Lokanathan Loka is from uh, Perth Lab Jakarta. And the last speaker will be Gai Yang Ho from uh, ITDP, uh, I, UITP, which is the International Association of public transport. So let me, let me brief you about, uh, give you a short opening remark and the big data these days, everyone hear about big data. What's the big data? We hear about it, but still many gaps of understanding big data. Like uh, what is big data? Where are they coming from? What's the benefit of it? How we process it? What it requires? and what's the linkage between big data and AI. So we have many, many still have a, a gaps in understanding and also gaps in applying big data in practice. I'm a transportation planner. I used to use data for transportation planning. So conventional way is we do survey, household survey for one day for the sample of 0.5% or 1% sample. The survey uh, staff goes to household. We do the survey, but that's the old practice. So compared to big data, imagine we have uh, all the mobile phone data. We know where people moves by what mode. That's the blessing from the heaven for transportation planners. So that's the big difference in a, in transport industry, not only planning, so uh, transport industries, logistics, and even commercial sectors, they are utilizing big data already, not only in the advanced countries. I, I travel a lot in uh, developing countries and uh, big data is already in use in many cases, but the big data doesn't come easily. So we, you need to have some kind of you know, institutional arrangement, also social consensus of using uh, the data. So to answer those questions, we will uh, do our best with the speakers. And uh, I will invite speakers one by one. Then all the uh, audiences, you can ask raise questions to the uh, Q&A box at any time, you know, during the session in the, uh, also even during, uh, during the Q&A sessions, please you know, press your questions, then we will convey that uh, question to the uh, speakers to get the best, best answer to that. So let's start with uh, uh, Mr. Rana, uh, his uh, ADB staff, Rana Hassan, his, uh, He's, he's an economist and he is very interested in using big data for evaluating economic impact and how what is the direction for interpreting the trend using big data. So uh, Rana, can you, the floor is yours. Can you have your presentation, please? 
Kijun, uh, thank you very much. And it's a real pleasure to be here uh, amidst uh, so many experts. And um, I'm an economist at ADB and together with my colleague uh, Yi Jiang, we've been working on urban transport and transport issues more generally using big data. And um, in addition to uh, presenting, I'm really here also to learn uh, Kijun from the experts uh, we have assembled over here. So uh, let's let's get to our slides where we're going to basically show some of the work uh, that we've been doing. And as I'd mentioned uh, earlier, this is um, work that's uh, being uh, led by my colleague Yi Jiang uh, in the research department at ADB. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, I, I think we all know very well the importance of transport. And um, from our perspective in the research department, we have been embarking on a set of studies which uh, have, have really been motivated by the idea that cities ultimately are the engines of growth. Uh, they are the engines of good jobs. They are the engines of innovation. And essentially, um, what makes cities function is really transport. It's mobility, being able to get from point A to point B to be able to interact. And um, it's, it's really central to uh, this idea of agglomeration economies that's, that's very important in allowing cities to play their engine of growth role. Um, and uh, on, on this, uh, there, there are several things that economists at least have really struggled with when it comes to try and, uh, and understand what types of policies and interventions can make cities function uh, better. And it all leads us back to this issue of transport. And so uh, evidence-based knowledge, um, uh, very necessary to, to support uh, transport policies, even from the perspective of uh, uh, economists. And um, what we've found uh, as we've been doing our work in this area that um, one can actually do good quality research um, using increasingly available geo-coded or geo-referenced uh, big data. And uh, this isn't just something uh, that's out there for the developed world, but uh, this, this type of data is increasingly available in developing cities. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, what I'll do in, in the next five, six minutes is simply give you um, an overview of some of the studies we've embarked on um, and, and essentially uh, very quickly, uh, this has to do with uh, measuring congestion using Google Maps trip data. There's some analysis we've done on accessibility of commuters to jobs. And, and in this case, we have been working with our colleagues in the Southeast Asia Regional Department, in, in particular the Transport Division, uh, looking at the case of the South Commuter Railway in the Philippines. Uh, we've also been looking at various applications of cell phone based data, so call detail records. Uh, and uh, finally, um, we are looking at uh, some city specific uh, studies. So one is on land value capture and urban density. Um, and the second one is very specifically targeted uh, at the city of Mumbai. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to quantify the benefits of the Mumbai Metro project uh, through choice of residence. So how basically the appearance of this big transport network um, influences decision making on where to stay. Uh, next slide, please. So um, basically, uh, this, this first example is, is quite a simple one. We were trying to uh, look at just how much congestion there is in major cities. Um, uh, next slide, please. So, uh, you know, just uh, we'll, we'll uh, come here right to the punchline. And essentially, what we did is for these 24 mega cities, each with a population of more than 5 million, we basically looked at uh, just uh, travel times using Google Map queries all on one day, June 3rd in 2019. So not this year, it's a pre-COVID uh, um, uh, time point for which we collected this data. And we looked at, um, we looked at uh, 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 origin des about 400 origin destination pairs. And, and we, we, we got these origin destination pairs basically looking at luminosity um, hotspots uh, across these cities. And, and we averaged the time it took uh, to travel between these 400 pairs, um, both off peak and on peak. And essentially, uh, this is what the numbers look like. And we found, for example, in Metro Manila, it's about, uh, it, it's almost 90% um, longer to be traveling on average between one of our hotspots to another hotspot um, as, as compared to an off-peak time. Uh, next slide, please. 
Um, now we're extending some of this work and what we're doing is uh, we have selected 10 uh, largest uh, cities in developing Asia. And since mid-December 2019, uh, we have collected about 162 million driving trips and 33 million transit trips. And essentially our, our goal is to use this data to identify where travel bottlenecks are and assess the impact of urban transport infrastructure. So essentially at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is an economic uh, cost benefit analysis, if you will, of, uh, of, of, of transport. And we'll also be able to look at some other issues uh, on, on, on choices uh, of, of location for both firms and uh, 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 workers. Next slide, please. Uh, this is just a simple picture and a, a few points on this accessibility analysis that we've done on the South Commuter Railway. Just very briefly, this uh, SCR project is designed to be about 55 kilometers in length. Uh, it will have about 19 stations between Blumenthal and Manila City in the north and then Columba in the south. And um, uh, essentially, the big question is, how will this um, South Commuter Railway really affect economic opportunities? Uh, next slide, please. So essentially, without going into too much details, uh, but using a lot of different types of uh, data sets, uh, what we have done is we've estimated a fairly simple model. And the punchline is that um, commuters in localities where they're going to be stations as part of the South Commuter Railway, they'll be able to access about 300,000 additional jobs uh, and thanks to this railway transport. So in, in terms of economic welfare, that's, that's really quite a tremendous impact. Uh, next slide, please. So moving forward, what we're gonna do is actually get more sophisticated. Uh, the, the, the numbers that I gave you were from a uh, relatively simple uh, partial equilibrium model in the language of economists. And what we're gonna head to now is a spatial computable general equilibrium model. And as part of this, we're actually going to be able to account, we're going to simulate um, various types of choices and shifts uh, uh, for the local economy. So for example, uh, changes, how, how this transport infrastructure might actually change this sectoral composition. So what types of firms are going to want to locate where? Um, what types of firms uh, will, will change? Um, and, and in doing this analysis, we'll be bringing in this, this issue of locational choice. And a key um, uh, point of entry is going to be called detailed record data. And, and we're in fact in discussions with uh, uh, one of the major telcos over here uh, on, on how to use uh, some sort of um, uh, um, origin destination data or, or, or commuter uh, traffic uh, flow data to simulate some of these issues. Next slide, please. Um, we also have uh, work that we are doing um, uh, regarding uh, mass transit systems. Uh, as as, as uh, some of you may not be knowing, but India's engagement with India on mass transit is, is quite uh, large. And, and ADB has working uh, for expanding metro systems in a number of uh, uh, cities. Uh, there's been Mumbai, Jaipur, uh, Bangalore, Chennai, Kochi, etc. Uh, next slide, please. And uh, the, the, the central, one of the central questions actually we, we want to address, and, it, and, and perhaps this is more an issue of advocacy at a very high level. Uh, th there is this little map that we have, and basically it's, it's an it's a infrastructure zoning map from Seoul in, in, in the Republic of Korea. And what it basically shows is you have these uh, uh, blue circles, which are the metro stations, and then you have these different colored uh, uh, um, uh, shades. Now, the ones in red are the locations where you have the tallest buildings, and, and, and that's really how you want this to be. So in all modern cities, the metro stations are opening up to extremely dense uh, 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 locations, and, and that basically allows the whole metro system to be a lot more efficient and possibly it allows land value capture uh, to be higher and in consonance, not, not in conflict with good urban design. And this is a feature that we think is it's worth highlighting to um, uh, officials in cities which have 
a lot of rigidities, a lot of uh, inflexibility in their land use regulations and their floor area restrictions, basically regulations which impede the height of buildings. And so one of the, the, the things we want to do is really bring big data and these simulation techniques to show that when you build a metro, it's very expensive and you can have a great engineering success, but for it to really have an economic impact, the transport infrastructure also has to gel well with your urban planning and land use uh, zoning. So, so this is a project which we are just starting off and um, uh, let's see where it goes. Um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is just, again, uh, uh, making uh, these points. Uh, these little boxes below show you the cases of uh, how density grew in the cities of Mumbai, Seoul, and Beijing. As you can see in the case of Seoul and Beijing, consistent with the chart that I showed just uh, uh, 20 seconds ago, you have a lot of vertical growth. But in the case of Mumbai, uh, you're not seeing vertical growth. And that's partly, uh, we think, because of um, the, the land use regulation. And in this project, essentially what we're going to be doing is we're also going to be using uh, 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 information on average building heights from uh, data that's been collected by the German Aerospace uh, Center. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is really my final slide and I'll just end very quickly in about uh, five, 10 seconds. We also have a uh, a, a project where we've uh, had a survey of about 3,000 households in Greater Mumbai. And um, this, uh, this data, when we combine it with information from Google Maps, driving and transit trip data, is again going to allow us to uh, really understand much better how residences, how households really think about uh, their choice of where to stay, uh, where to rent, um, in response to changes in transport infrastructure. So overall, I'll stop here now. I'd like to just mention that we think um, that, that the potential of diff using these different big data sources is really high. And uh, I very much look forward to uh, the discussion later on. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Rana. I think you have a very fascinating application of big data for India, Seoul, Mumbai. I think it's you know, very interesting how you use that data for urban development, interpreting urban development, feasibility study for big infrastructure. I think it is, this is the example, you know, how data became information, information became, you know, knowledge and insight and the foresight. So I think it's, a, I'm so glad that ADB has that activity in, you know, in my organization. Thanks very much. So that's, uh, let's move on to next speaker. He's a uh, Kony Huizenga. He's a good friend of ADB for a long time, I think. And uh, he, he is leading another ADB's data, transport data related initiative, which is called Asia Tra Transport Outlook. So in his fra uh, ATO framework, he taps all the transport data and big data to help DMCs and ADBs to pre preparing projects and uh, monitoring the project. Let's hear what he has. Kony, floor is yours. You are on, on mute. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Kijun. Uh, I think that listening to today's uh, speakers and to the speakers of the last few days, uh, the, the most common remark that I have heard is how important transport is for the, the economic and social development of, of Asia. But, but the question is like, do we really know the transport sector? And I think that this, this is actually the, the origin for the Asian transport outlook that the, that the Asian Development Bank is embarking on now. Uh, can I have the first slide? So why are we doing this Asian Transport Outlook? So as, as you can see here, we want to establish and we want to strengthen the knowledge base on transport in Asia Pacific region. And we want to do this in a manner that emphasizes and helps to create an institutionalized process for data and information collection, uh, analysis and documentation. There have been quite a lot of <coughs> individual projects over the last years in order to, to collect information on the transport sector and to develop indicators 
and, and to, to map transport. But what we do not have at the moment is an ongoing institutionalized process which, which actually helps uh, policymakers and practitioners. In order to ensure that, uh, that the ATO is actually going to be used, we are linking it quite closely to the, to the way that ADB is planning and, and delivering its, its transport sector. But at the same time, it's important that the, that the ATO will also support national governments in their transport policy development and delivery. Uh, then we know that there are a whole range of international agreements on sustainable development and climate change uh, in which transport plays an important role. And if the, the Asian Transport Outlook is successful in helping the Asian Development Bank, at the same time, it would also help other multi and bilateral donors who are working on transport as well. And last but not least, I think it is also important that the transport outlook is there uh, to enable research on the transport sector in, uh, in, in, the, in the region. Next slide. So there are, uh, how did we design the, the transport outlook? And we're looking at uh, basically at two key processes. Huh? We're looking at ADB strategy 2030, which was adopted uh, last year. And that we say the operational priorities, uh, which are in ADB strategy 2030, that we say we should, with the transport outlook, we should be able to measure the contribution of transport to realizing uh, these operational priorities in ADB's strategy 2030. And I mentioned before that we have a whole range of international agreements uh, sustainable Development Goals is, is an important one, which I will say a bit more about later. Uh, the, the Paris Agreement, but there's also an agreement on road safety, there's an agreement on financing, there's an agreement on urban development. And each of those is intended to, to structure and to, to direct national and local level policies as well. So, so we are taking those on board as well. If we then summarize this, we say that we are looking at, uh, at three access related goals that we want to, to focus on in the transport outlook. One is rural access, uh, the other is urban access, and uh, in addition to that, national and regional connectivity. And uh, we want to look in terms of developmental impacts, we want to focus on road safety, climate change, and air pollution. Equity and gender, as you can see here, are being mentioned specifically uh, under rural access and urban access, but they will be mainstreamed through the whole, uh, through the whole process. Uh, next. So how, what are we looking at? We are looking at transport data indicators and currently we have a, a long list of about 400, uh, 400 indicators uh, that, that we want to document in about 51 countries. And these indicators, they are developed over different categories, uh, the transport infrastructure, transport activity. Uh, we are looking at uh, the, the impacts like climate change, uh, air pollution and, and road safety. But at the same time, we're also looking at, at, uh, at COVID as well. On the right hand side, uh, and that I think is also partly the linkage to, uh, to, to the big data issue, is that where are we currently facing difficulties? Uh, we, are look, we have difficulties uh, with respect to data on walking and cycling infrastructure, access, connectivity, rural transport services, employment, asset management, and gender disaggregation. And Rana in his presentation already mentioned a number of these areas that they are focusing on that in their research. And I will come back to some of this uh, when I speak more about big data. The idea is that uh, in the first phase of the, the transport outlook, which will run until February 20, uh, 2021, we will be focusing on national and regional level data. And the idea is also to, to add a specific urban data set in, uh, in, in the phase two of the transport outlook. Uh, next slide. In addition to, uh, to, the, to the indicators, we also want to look at uh, how the policies in the different countries are, are organized. And this is not so much a, a big data uh, topic, but we think that it is important, like if we want to look at the outlook of transport in, in Asia, we need to look at, at policies in place as well. 
Uh, we will do that by focusing on institutional frameworks. We will look at, uh, let's say, who is responsible for what type of uh, transport. We will look at the specific policy frameworks and what targets are included in that. And we will look at, uh, at funding arrangements. Yeah, next slide. So in terms of the, the big data, uh, one of the, the, the biggest assets that we have as a community at the moment is, is open streets. And open streets is basically a satellite application or a satellite function which, which is documenting the, the, entire, the entire built uh, environment, uh, including the roads. Uh, at the moment, we have a situation that about 95 or 97 percent of the roads in the world are, are documented in open streets. And why is this important? Like, uh, I think that uh, Kijun mentioned this in his opening remarks where he spoke about, uh, where he spoke about surveys in order to get information. Uh, if we go back to the sustainable development goals, there are two important transport related targets. One is about rural access uh, that people would live within two kilometers of an all season road. And there is one which is about urban access. And that is about people living within 500 meters of, of a bus or a metro stop or convenient access to public transport. In the past, in order to measure these indicators, you literally had to go to all the places and do all the surveys. And nowadays, we, we are actually able to, to measure these indicators and to have dialogues with, with policymakers and say, look, this, this is the situation in your country. This is the situation in this province. And, and ADB also, in planning its investments, is able to make use of this. So, so it, it shows that uh, in the past, we would have global agreements, we would have targets and we would have indicators, but we had great problems in measuring them. And with, this, uh, with, with the use of big data, we were suddenly able to, to, to actually measure this in a, in a much more convenient manner. And I think that uh, Rana already did an excellent job about a whole host of other applications. Uh, and I think that some of the next speakers will speak about that as well. Uh, then uh, to my final slide. Hmm. Uh, final words, uh, and I think that this is an important quote. Uh, data that sit unused are no different from data that were never collected in the first place. And I think that there is a danger if we talk about transport data, there is a, there is a danger as well when we talk about big data, is that, that we will have too many data. And like, if we are not having a process in place to, to actually utilize those data, then it's actually a wasted effort. At the same time, and then the, the final, final quote for a number of people online, I think that they are familiar with Lee Shipper, uh, who is actually, I think, the, the father of transport statistics. And, and Lee had a, had a very simple quote with respect to, to the transport data collection. The best way to keep going is to keep going. That's, uh, we hope to interact with a lot of you on the, the Asian transport outlook uh, in, in the future. Like either that you say like, are you collecting this? How are you going to collect that? Uh, or that you say we are collecting certain data so that we, we very much see that the, the ATO is also an, uh, an interactive process. So we have two uh, emails here at the bottom. So please make use of those if you want to uh, get in touch with us. Thank you, uh, Kijun. Thank you, Connie. I think the ATO is very exciting. And uh, usually ADB had a struggle to have a nice, good data for project evaluation and preparations. But if AD, uh, ATO is established, it will be a great convenience for ADB as well as the DMCs. I look, you know, everyone should look forward to what a ATO will bring to us. And uh, next, Next speaker is from Korea, Dr. Dongik Chang. He is the, right in the middle of big data and AI uh, business in Korea Transport Institute. That is the National Institute in uh, Transport in Korea. So 
I think he has a very fascinating examples, concrete examples and applications. So let me invite Dr. Dongik Jang to the presentation. Thank you, Gijun. Nice to meet you, everyone. I'm Dongik Jang at the Korea Transport Institute. Today, I talk about the diagnosis of transport using mobility big data. Since all 10 minutes are given for this presentation, especially I focus on the mobility big data center in South Korea with the big data platform. And a smart disease project related to COVID-19 of the South Korea. Next slide, please. This center is using various, various mobility big data to extract insight on the activity patterns contributing to smarter and more targeted urban planning. One is GPS of car navigation, another is GPS and cell location mobile, of mobile data. The other is change car data of the public transportation users. Car navigation, cell phone, and change car is the, the key data of the mobile big data platform. Car navigation and cell phone data that are anonymized are uh, being purchased by private mobile company. Transportation card data that are provided by the public transport providers are integrated and managed by the government. These mobile data are used to estimate the travel pattern by the constructing the trajectory of the individual movement. Coty have uh, data driven analysis with more movement, more people and modes. Next slide, please. Recently, South Korea is building a various kind of big data centers as a strategy to revitalize the data economy, finance, environment, energy, and distribution, transport, transportation, and so on. So many big data centers. 10 big data platform and 94 big data centers are established in previous years in the Korea. It's planned to invest a, a total of the 127 million US dollars over three years to building big data centers. And last year, the project is being promoted with a total amount of 54 million US dollars. In the big data centers, various data are collected, standardized, integrated, and anonymized. A big data center is a data hub, and a platform is the service using the data. And these data are provided to various fields, such as training on AI model and startup companies. The first stage of the mobile big data platform is to collect mobility data and non-mobility data. Mobile data includes GPS of public car and parking, mobile accident information, and so on. Non-mobility data include weather, credit card, point of interest, SNS, and so on. In the second phase, this information is combined to provide polygon-based information, such as floating population, staying population, weather states, and pine dust. In the third phase, urban mobility analysis service is provided. One example is selected link analysis, that is information about where car passing the, through the particular road comes from and where is it is going. In the first phase, urban mobility and connected feature service are provided by the mobility platform and the big data centers. Next slide, please. The figure in the middle showed Coty's data strategies. Coty is the agent in charge of the big data platform and the big data centers, collecting various data through the, the primary data industry, such as mobile phone, credit card, and approved vehicle company. Coty analyzed mobile data to estimate its travel routes and means of the transport analyze the route of the public transport users using a training card and use the, use the navigation user data to determine the route of the travel. Upper left figure, there are that are used the location of the information of mobile phone users in the every five minutes to determine the, the travel pattern and the, distinguish the main place of stay, such as the home 
uh, work. Upon right is the result of analyzing how many people are moving using transport, public transport for each road link using the transit card data. Low left, please low left show, please show the low left. Left, please. That's good. The low left is load in the northwest of the Seoul, showing where the people who pass the specific roads come from and enter the Seoul by the using the user navigation route. This year was used to formulate strategies to alleviate congestion on, the, on this road. Cost here provide various, various analysis research using mobile speed data. These research are being used for analysis of inter-regional mobility, analysis of travel time within the metropolitan areas, and lifestyle analysis. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. This is the last slide. The last slide is the COVID-19 smart management system of the Korea. The COVID-19 SMS is based on the Korea National Tra Strategic Smart City Program. The National Strategic Smart City Program has launched for the purpose of the developing standardized open data hub architecture, which will be the common basis to transparency and sharing administrative service and facilitates the economy. Uh, yes. The, the National City Strategy City Program's total budget is 180 billion US dollars. The COVID-19 SMS system could be developed rapidly using the this smart city program. The core of the COVID-19 SMS is to trace the movement of the confirmed cases. Data collected under the platform is limited to confirmed cases or highly suspected cases and required to notification to the affected people prior to the collection. Only personal information gathered will be anonymized to avoid the risk of the identity exposure. Access to the data platform is limited only to KCDC official and the local government health official in charge of the contact tracing. The data platform has the strength and occurrence for response to COVID-19 in three ways. First, streaming line of the administrative process require for the personal data request. By bringing all the relevant parties to one place, the platform makes this process less bureaucratic and less time consuming overall. It is short in cutting the time to complete data analysis to process from 24 hours to less than 10 minutes. Second, the platform is strengthening personal data protection access to this personal information kept in the platform is strictly limited and the system logs all the access records. So the big data analysis provides input for the timely government intervention and swift response to the DGs. Next slide, please. This is the last thing I announced today. Thanks for the listening to my presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Zhang. I think you know, Dr. Zhang presented a very condensed way, also a very uh, specific way of using big data, navigation data, mobile phone data, and uh, card, uh, public transport card data. I think that's the main mm -hmm. you know, accessible data mm -hmm. where the, any country has a mobile phone. So mobile phone data is very accessible and Google navigation data or other navigation data is very useful you know i see many of the analysis using mobile phone data like a selected link analysis or isoscopic you know, analysis those are the very useful tool for transportation planning and the management 
also the application of big data in COVID-19 response was a good example. I, I heard this a good uh, work doing well in Korea in that way. So thank you very much for uh, your uh, very condensed uh, presentation. I hope we can have some other occasion to have more full presentation from your side. And thank you very much. And next speaker, we'll move to next speaker, Mr. Sriganesh Lokanathan. I think big data, we mostly talk about in you know, a technical side, economic side, but he has, he, he is leading uh, Pearl's Lab Jakarta. He has a more augmented uh, viewpoint about big data use. So how you see how he can, uh, how to use, utilize big data for wider spectrum or different aspect of the uh, society. Uh, please welcome Mr. Siriganesh uh, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Kijun. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, to be invited to speak with such an esteemed uh, panel. And I've been looking at all the presentations with much interest. We are here as much to share as much to, uh, to learn from the others as well. Um, so just to give you sort of a brief uh, uh, sense of the lab, uh, that where I, where I, where I work, where I'm the data innovation and policy lead at uh, Pulse Lab Jakarta. Next slide, please. Uh, we are a data innovation facility and the first of its kind in, in Asia, one of the first, uh, where we leverage data innovation coupled with uh, human-centered design in the context of uh, crafting context-specific fit-for-purpose embedded developmental and humanitarian solutions. We are a joint initiative of the United Nations as well as the government of Indonesia. Uh, we have a regional focus, uh, but a lot of our work is also in Indonesia itself by which you're being located here. Um, started out and this lab started out in 2012, 2013. Um, we've been transitioning uh, uh, into phase two. Uh, as a data innovation lab, and, and you can see from this slide, you know, we don't necessarily work in one specific sector. We actually are in the intersections between develop, data innovation and different developmental domains. And so over our, the course of our history, we've done things in many different issue spaces and problem spaces. Um, and in our phase two, we are now sort of moving from showcasing the art of the possible to finding ways to make these innovations properly embedded and mainstream with the elements of scale that are involved uh, through the use of uh, human-centered design logic. So the four priority areas are disaster response and climate change, urban dynamics, which includes transport, food security and agriculture, and financial inclusion. Um, over the course of our existence, we've done work in a broad range of um, um, aspects related to mobility and uh, uh, transport. Uh, part of my challenge for today's presentation was to try and deliver sort of a, so, so, some cohesive uh, narrative around how these can be leveraged without the use of visuals, which uh, thankfully, you know, my, my, my colleagues on the panel have sort of showcased very good examples of these uh, uses of innovative uh, new data sources, and in particular, big data uh, in practice. So some of the work that we've done has looked into sort of mobility around uh, uh, post-disaster situations, especially in the South Pacific and even in Indonesia, using uh, pseudonymized call detail records from different mobile operators. Um, we've looked at trying to leverage, you know, open street maps, uh, which was mentioned earlier uh, by one of the colleagues, also as a way to try and do, uh, look at points of interest and look at alternative routing post-disaster uh, and how these could be planned for humanitarian actors. Uh, we've, over the course, we've explored about 50 different types of alternate data partnerships that we've sort of engaged in. And I'm sort of putting all the official and traditional statistics into one bucket, but we know that that is actually much, much, much larger. Um, we've inferred commuter statistics from uh, Twitter data, for example, and tried to leverage that not just for the policymakers, but also for citizens to understand uh, mobility at localized levels. 
Um, similarly, you know, looking at uh, trying to use CCTV footage to tackle uh, traffic safety. Uh, this was with uh, Jakarta Smart Cities. We've used ride hailing data from uh, the transportation service providers such as, you know, Grab, for example, is one of our, uh, we are the regional data partner for Grab. And we've looked at this in, in Bangkok, for example, to try and leverage that data for a variety of uses, for a, from speed profiling, traffic now casting and prediction, macroscopic traffic flow modeling. And even, for example, by coupling it with sort of air quality sensor data, trying to understand quantify population exposure to air pollution. Um, but this is not the only part of what we do. And as, as, as the title says, you know, you know, you know the, the a key part of the title of my presentation is also about human-centered design, right? And the importance of human-centered design when thinking about um, uh, more efficient, inclusive transport uh, and sustainable transport development for us is, 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 is a very important part. So we've done service design work with regional governments in looking at sort of last mile solutions, specifically in, in one case, for example, in the um, area of Makassar, which is a region of uh, Indonesia, look which uh, vans for, you know, and in a, in a way that it can sort of also meet some last mile um, uh, needs. Um, one of our most recent work has actually been trying to understand the various factors that influence women's perception of safety uh, in relation to transport and especially, you know, after dark. Uh, so that was a, the work title after dark, which was done with uh, UN women, uh, trying to look at the challenges that women face when traveling at night and how these facets affect their mobility and travel choices, which in turn affect their, you know, women's economic uh, choices as well. The kinds of decisions that they will make for in relation to uh, leveraging or not to leverage potential economic opportunities. Um, so um, if you could just keep it at the, at the next slide, this was, um, could you move to the next slide? Yes. So I'm just going to keep this in the background and there's more information on our, on our website that is, that is there. Um, and I want to use the remaining time, you know, I've given you sort of an indication of some of the work that we've done across a wide different uh, arenas. Uh, often these are done, I mean, actually not often, all the time they're done in partnerships with um, other UN agencies as well as either city governments, transportation planners or, or, or departments. Um, and and, and uh, the, the idea for that is really to make sure that we can sustain this kind of work or influence the thinking in, in, in people, in the policy makers and decision makers who work with these um, uh, in issues related to urban uh, uh, mobility and even sort of, you know, uh, peri-urban mobility aspects. So to just to concentrate for the, for the rest of the, uh, my time, I want to concentrate on three points. Uh, and the overarching theme to all of these points are, you know, in a way has been touched by, by, previous, uh, by the previous speakers as well, is really about that, you know, we're trying to make use of alternative data from different sources uh, and make use of what may be there already rather than necessarily thinking about customized proprietary sensors uh, uh, that have to be, which may require huge investments. So the questions that we're trying to see in a way is how do you make transport more efficient and inclusive by leveraging um, um, existing data, even if it is not the kind of traditional data that, that transportation planners and modelers are, are used to. So my first point is that um, alternate data, data sources can provide mobility insights at high spatial temporal resolutions, and which has been shown you know, in, 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 in what has been presented before us, but its effective use requires partnerships across a number of different disciplines. It's not just about the number of different types of disciplines, but also the kinds of partnerships that you need to be able to strike out to both uh, access this data in a responsible fashion, as well as to make use of it. And um, yesterday, for example, I was on a, on a, on a, on a um, as a discussant for uh, the bank, uh, the World Bank had invited me to be a discussant 
um, to comment on their 2021 uh, proposed uh, World Development Report, which is an influential report, which this time is going to be about data for better lives. And I was making those comments yesterday, and I realized that some of those same aspects actually you know, are relevant here to this conversation today as well, which is that when we try to leverage, when transportation specialists try to leverage this, these, these insights, there's a long transition period that you need to both understand the provenance of the data, right? Um, um, as Kijun mentioned in his sort of introductory remarks, um, you know, the way transportation planners and modelers, uh, uh, you know, the, the old way, older ways of doing that was to say, you know, I know the universe that I'm trying to model. And from there, I pick a sample and I, I, and I then model from that point onwards. And now you're asking transportation modelers and planners to work with data that they don't understand, fully understand the provenance of, do not understand how the data creation and the data points may change over time and space. Um, so, and at the same time, it's not data that they have actual control over. So what are the ways of trying to actually have those conversations, strike up those conversations for access to this data? Uh, several things come into play in that aspect. So, for example, you, I, uh, you know, there are reasons. For example, in in, in for example, in Bangalore, uh, one of uh, not a place that we worked in, but you know, sort of a, when uh, was providers were providing data uh, for public policy, they were also concerned about not providing too much granular data because they are actually in competition and the government also thinks of them as competition in terms of the transportation service. So how do you strike these partnerships, mutually beneficial partnerships around data becomes a key point. Um, the second point that I want to make is that the effective use of all of these alternative data affords the possibility of actually even rethinking how transportation planning sometimes happen. To give you an example, and this was sort of based on a sort of project that I was involved in a few years back while I was helping uh, the, uh, the government of Sri Lanka, um, uh, that was going to uh, put a lot of investment into sort of the softer parts of the transportation infrastructure, linking up all the traffic lights, you know, GPSs on buses, you know, bus priority access at, at traffic lights, etc. So the idea was when you have these sort of, you know, not very expensive sensors networks also being deployed, coupled with data from CDRs, et cetera, which gives you this high frequency data about mobility and the impacts that it might happen when you sort of change some modality. So if you make one lane, you know, if you do one lane um, um, diversions or, you know, you convert a, a two way lane into one lane, depending on the peak times, you can test these sort of um, um, uh, policy changes at very uh, relatively easier um, than having to do this cause a large amount of disruption over a longer period of time. So the to when you have this access data uh, able to access this data in near real time, you know there is a certain set of other challenges that happen when it needs to be real time. But even if it is in near real time, it affords those possibilities of rethinking how one may be able to do uh, uh, transportation uh, planning and, and management. My third and, and final point really is that um, it is quite seductive uh, to think that, you know, and it's seductive for, for a person like me who sort of engaged in sort of proselyting the use of uh, alternate sources of data that, that we can leverage this and sit at some computer somewhere and understand what's going on in the world, whether it be in transport or some other sector. So uh, that seductive idea is false, right? Uh, the reason is, so to give you an example, is that, you know, the point that I'm making here is that, you know, understanding the human at the end of the who's going to be affected by these choices that are made at the planning and, and development stage uh, uh, planning and uh, transport planning and modeling is very important. So that's why we are sort of big proponents in the use of human-centered design logic in sort of thinking of solutions. So even in our most, one of our most recent work, which was in, in, um, um, in Indonesia, in fact, where we have, which I mentioned earlier in relation to the, the After Dark project, right? Um, 
what those uh, ground level work uh, revealed to us is that the importance for women who are using uh, public transport after dark, they don't necessarily always use the, the bus halls or the, 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 the stops that are designated. They actually choose to wait in crowded areas where there's a lot of activity, right? So when you're making these cho choices about where to put your, your transit points or where to put uh, the bus stops or the other or, um, or, or stops for uh, any of those other um, uh, modes. Understanding how humans contextualize their needs of transport is very important. And we are happy that, for example, that both um, 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 Gojek, uh, uh, the ride hailing uh, firm in, in Indonesia, as well as some of the regional governments here are using some of these uh, uh, insights to rethink how they do um, 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 uh, these bus halls and these, uh, these, these, these stops for, for, for um, uh, passengers. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll leave you at that with, 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 some final, with one final concluding thought, and, and, and that is to come back to my title here, which is this, this is about data innovation and human-centered design and whether we are there yet. We are not quite there yet. But you know, clearly what you see from the other panelists that have been talking about this, you know, this is a very different uh, uh, discussion that I'm having with, with transportation specialists. I'm not around when I first intersection uh, between those three. So there's, there's a lot of advancement that has happened, but there's still more work to be done in trying to make this actually mainstream. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sri Ganesh. It's a very insightful presentation. I think you, know, you, you broaden our thinking on big data, how you can be more human-centered, how we perceive also that you know, alternative data, surrogate data can, have, can be utilized. That's very, very useful comments you made. We are running late so we are, we go over to next speaker is uh, miss kayang ho she is in ui from uitp she's a leader of research and policy development in the asia pacific center for transport excellence so the floor is yours miss kayang ho thank you kijun and um, I want to also thank my peer speakers for sharing such insightful big data and data analytics in terms of how it's transforming the transport systems. And I think Courtney had a really good point there about how data, unused data is, is actually the same as not collecting that data. And this is where AI, I think, comes to play because big data is simply can get too big without artificial intelligence. So I'll, in the next 10 minutes, I'll try to take you through one of the case study out of the 17 case studies we actually collected when we were looking at artificial intelligence and public transport and just show that, num that we had a number of um, projects actually is highly related um, between artificial intelligence and big data. Uh, next, please. And this is simply because the processing of data is becoming increasingly complex. As Kichun mentioned, you know, from years ago, we would be looking data simply from surveys, um, you know, collecting those data points. But as we now see that data is becoming, there are multiple sources from sensors to text, from text, voice, images, and videos, and also the need of speed of, of real-time data. And AI becomes that key in terms of meeting that need and allow to have, and able to comprehensively um, di uh, analyze all that data. Because ultimately, if you think carefully, data, AI is actually just about recognizing pattern. And as we're seeing mature out AI algorithm, they will recognize more pattern than human can possibly detect in that short amount of time. Uh, next, please. So artificial intelligence sounds complex. Um, and I don't blame anyone who still haven't got the graphs of that. Uh, we took a year to understand the different um, jargons in, in artificial intelligence, looking at 
um, how artificial intelligence is being defined is an extremely, um, despite it seems like a, you know, a, a hype word, but is actually a technology stemmed from back in the 1950s. So we, um, we, went, we walked through this whole year project and um, consulted over 100 uh, experts. And we try to simplify the term AI to make sure that you know, no one's being extremely scared by this big term. And, and it comes down to, it can be simply defined as complex math that, is, that has the following qualities. It's able to learn and adapt, able to mimic as well as exhibits creativity and able to, pr um, to improve the existing process. And as much as, um, as, much as we all think, you know, AI is the, those talking droids and, um, you know, and conscious robots, thanks to the Hollywood movies, we're not there. We, um, when you talk to any of the AI experts, they can tell you that we don't, are, the AI um, algorithm we have now is really no smarter than a toddler. We're not there in terms of what we call the general in, um, intelligence and have consciousness and able to act and behave like human. Next, please. So one of the projects I wanted to share with you and how the relationship with AI and, um, and big analytics is this project that's embarked by SMRT busing of Singapore. Often we think AI is these big projects um, and it is when you start talking about big data potentially because it's actually the data itself is the foundation of the data where it needs a lot of investment. But AI can come in so all sorts of forms and it's, not, and it's no longer a luxury of um, multi, multi million dollar organizations nor developed cities. As, one, as um, Kijun mentioned, we're now looking at analyzing mobile data because smartphone is easily accessible. If anyone who has a smartphone, you already have an AI system in your hand. You, ha you have your digital assistants. Anyone who do online shop, shop, uh, shopping already have uh, um, digital assistants. So AI exists in so many forms. And this is one of the example that showed you, um, that showed us that the AI project didn't actually start from being a actually AI project. It started with the problem where SMRT was facing a problem about having increasing number of accident caused by drivers. And they wanted to understand how to improve the driver's behaviors and how to mitigate more um, the risk. So te installing telematic system was essential to have a post accident analysis. But once they installed this system, they realized that um, you know, the system was able to track so much more data than they anticipate, as well as once they combined with other data, such as personal data and operation, operational data, they are able to do so much more than just doing post analysis. They were actually able to be a proactive in terms of mitigating risk. And this started the birth of ProLearn, and it was a three-year, uh, a well over three-year project. And you can see here um, that, I mean, I had to really simplify it here, but the number of data point was just impossible for a, hum you know, for a human analyst to um, identify, hence the um, use of machine learning was deployed. Next, please. And often AI is not a silver bullet in a sense that you will get your instantaneous return on investment. It takes time. And I was mentioning the, the project of SMRT. It took them over years to refine and to improve the results. And you can see from the graph here, you know, once they um, they deploy the serve, uh, the analytical system, it took them year by year to manage to bring them down to able to have an accuracy over 30%. And that was helping them to really mitigating the risk in terms of identifying potential high risk drivers before the accident can happen. And this has helped them to um, not only you know, improve in terms of driver's behaviors, obviously um, having less accident on the road, but it really improved the quality of their training. They were able to bring in the driver before they have an accident, identify the issue. And at the end of the day, it was creating a much better culture to proact um, in terms of that proactiveness of use of data and allowing to use that data by the uh, organization. So AI needs to be trained. Um, time and patience is definitely needed when you think about deployment of such data, of such a system. 
and this ongoing feed allowing to continue to look at and refine the model to see what additional data can be added definitely helps to improve the AI performance. Next, please. So today, because of the time, um, I'm only able to share with you, you know, some of the uh, guiding principles, but I wanted to show that when we were looking at the guiding principles for AI, two out of the four is really dependent on data. Because um, in terms of developing long term comprehensive sustainable data strategy and moving to a data oriented culture, because data is the foundation of AI and you can only have good solutions when there's good data. When you have poor data or incomprehensive incompre data, you'll lead to the a um, AI biases. And that is often what we don't want and it's the ethics of AI as well to look into. And that also, and the, the, um, because of the AI project, it, it was actually helping us to lead to the second topic we're working on, but also a very critical point that we need to talk about in the public transport is about data sharing. You can only, deploy AI successfully and ethically when there's unbiased data and comprehensiveness. And data sharing becomes that guilt goal that we need to achieve to encourage more stakeholders to collaborate. I think what, when we look at all the projects being presented today, it's, it's a multi-stakeholder um, collaboration. None of them were solely operating on their own and having data source just from one organization. And also the culture of that data driven is needed and it needs to be endorsed by top managements and top leaders around the cities. Uh, next, please. So one of the big key, um, key takeaway is this is um, from our project and looking at big data or, or even artificial intelligence is that people needs to become needs to come before the technology. A number of lessons were learned and shared. And these were the couple I, I want to share with you today because First of all, AI needs human touch. It needs the monitoring of human and it needs us to avoid over-reliance of AI because AI or even the big data and any big data analytics is a, tech, is a type of technology, but it can fail one day and we need to make sure human are understanding what to do and when that fails. And also making sure that the biases are being looked at and to be verified and to make sure that we are not coming up with a very skewed solution. And then, of course, human is, plays a big role in what often we don't really talk about is the way we collect, clean, verify, and organize data. And as I mentioned before um, in the previous slide, that AI is not a luxury to um, you know, multi-billion multi dollar companies. There, there are things you can start small, but you just need to have a holistic plan and think big and a, success, and a proper business model to support the AI de deployment. Because when, once you're looking at getting, collecting that, all that data and you want data analytics to come into play, it, it is a live living system. So don't, there's no need to look for ideal solution in the beginning. Um, you just need to make sure you have planned and make sure there's a step-by-step -step approach to it. And to be honest, when you look at, you know, diagnose the each AI so solutions or systems is about doing specific tasks very well. And so when we are faced with a challenge, think about that challenge and how to break that job into much smaller refined tasks. And that's where the AI application can come in and identify the gap and be an added value. And most important of all, technology is merely a tool and communication is critical in order to have multiple stakeholder support. And that's all today. Thank you. Thank you, Gayang. I think it's excellent. You, you, you know, you presented the le lessons learned from your experience. I totally agree. You know, AI is a tool, and you need more understanding or start small. I think that's very important. Many people think that oh, big data, we can fish something out of it, but it's not the uh, right approach. I think as time is short, so I will finish commenting on your presentation. Then we will go into the uh, Q&A session. Uh, I received quite many good questions from uh, audiences. And uh, I will go for big question first. One of the big question is, what is the big data? 
that's a good question. You know, when we say big data, is it size of it or you know, uh, complexity of it? You know, how you who can who can answer that question? Is it uh, Sri Ganesh? You okay? So I'll take a crack at it. You know, I think in in all fields, you know, definitions are important. But in big data is one where I sometimes find myself saying that definition is sometimes not the most important thing. Right. Ultimately, you know, today's big data is tomorrow's data. So there are certain challenges that come from the sheer volume of it and the fact that there is multi-dimension, multi-dimensionality that, that, that occurs with a lot of different types of data, which means you're using different tools. Right. Um, but depend, and so you might need to also use different techniques. But any large, sufficiently large, complex data could sort of meet the bar for being defined as, as big data. Uh, but I think um, we'll do away with those definitions in the next five to 10 years and just start calling it data. Thank you, thank you. And I think another big question is you know, how we utilize big data for let me let me find There's so many questions I have to scroll around uh, for assessing the pandemic recovery and uh, I think you can find question exact wording of the question in the, okay uh, preparing post digester need assessment and digester recovery plan for land transport operation suitable for COVID-19 crisis, what big data can do it? You know, can you, and can anyone answer to, to that question? It's a big question, but a very important question. Um, Kijun, I can, I can take a shot at that. Yeah. Um, just based on this uh, work that we've been doing for Philippines and now we're starting for uh, Indonesia. And essentially it's very, uh, much related to this uh, current uh, pandemic and uh, essentially what we're doing is uh, you know we, we the epidemiologists have these models where they can tell us uh, on the basis of how much social contact there is between different people in the population and what that's going to mean for the spread of the disease so you've got the epidemiological model and and the big data is super useful because the big data allows us to figure out uh, for example, you know, during the uh, the ECQ, the, the 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 community, the strictest community quarantine we had in the Philippines, and especially in Metro Manila, we can see what movements there were in the city. Uh, we we can see how much just staying at home was taking place versus trips to retail, trips to groceries, trips to workplaces, etc. And uh, uh, that that's actually quite useful. And on the basis of that, uh, one of the things we've been able to say is that a new normal uh, using uh, uh, social dis distancing policies, masks, et cetera, uh, could have a uh, good impact on really reducing the infectiousness of the disease. Now, this kind of analysis, it really relies on big data and, and in particular, call detail records. So, so in fact, uh, we, we have uh, here in the Philippines, call detail records has been made available by Sun, uh, uh, Cellular, uh, Smart, and Globe to the University of Philippines uh, Computer Science Department. They've been cranking out these numbers. So uh, I don't want to say uh, uh, go on and on, but but it's very very directly uh, related. It really tells you what what's actually happening out there in terms of social context, which for this disaster is critical for policymakers to know. Right. Over. Thank you. And Kony, you have uh, something to add on? Yes, uh, thank you, Kijun. Uh, I think I also wanted to focus uh, the, the attention of the attendees on a on a recent paper that was uh, published by ADB on this on this topic on uh, on COVID and transport, and and maybe the the secretariat can also post the link to to the paper uh, in the in the in the chat box or in the Q and A for 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 the participants. But I think. Uh, if we look at the, the, the COVID crisis, that uh, no, no, never have people talked so much about Google Maps, about Apple data, uh, with respect to how people are, tra are traveling as in the days of, of, of COVID. So, so in that sense, uh, you could say that the, the corona crisis actually has been very effective in, in promoting the use of 
uh, of Google Maps and, and Apple data and other big data in terms of studying transport patterns. Uh, and I think that there was also a question from Bangladesh about this, about uh, the, the impact of COVID on, on transport systems. And I think that the paper and uh, the strategy that ADB is, is proposing there uh, in terms of, of rebuilding the transport sector uh, after the COVID crisis could be quite useful uh, for, for, for that as well. Right, thank you. I have a, one more question to uh, Rana. The question is, in this time of tight fiscal constraint, can panelists advise how DMCs can put forward the business case to justifying funding the new project for collecting big data? It's a very good question. Rana, can you? Right, sure. And, and you know, uh, again, uh, I, I think this will, the, the answer really depends on the kind of um, uh, big data that you want to collect. Uh, my sense, my own experience uh, in, in some of the projects I've been involved in is actually, um, you know, it's, it's more about uh, coordination among different agencies. And then there are, of course, some of the regulatory and privacy issues, some of those legal issues. Uh, you know, um, I, I, I think uh, it's interesting that uh, in, in we, we do really have pretty good data science uh, um, capabilities that have been developed all over the world. And in fact, it, this is one crisis. What it's showing us is we, we're all communicating seamlessly really through things like Zoom, MS Teams, et cetera. So wherever the teams are located, they, they can actually work on these things. And, and I have found it's, it's not really the funding for the big data that's, that's been an issue. It's really some of the um, legal and regulatory issues that need to be worked out and the time that's spent on coordinating between the different agencies and the players. So uh, that's my, my answer. Not, not so much funding is, the, is a challenge, uh, in, in terms of the things I've been working on, it's more uh, really coordination and getting the different agencies and people to talk together. So that, if I may, I can uh, add that to that from ADB's perspective. You know, I was working on big data activities in different countries. And what you more need is consultation, talking among, you know, I was work, uh, working to promote mobile phone data use in uh, different countries. And I have to talk to mobile phone companies and government. So finally, I ADB could agree with the mobile phone company and government. We prepared a TOR, technical TOR, for how to analyze uh, the big data to produce the output from big data. Also, we made agreement with the well, not ADB, we make the government and the mobile phone company to come to the agreement that government will buy the data from mobile phone company in the competition basis. So that's the, that's the uh, stage I got, then COVID broke out. So the activity was a bit uh, delayed at the moment. That's my comment. So as Rana says, it's more of the thinking and the intention rather than the uh, financial issues we can see. We can help out DMCs if they have any uh, interest. Also, we have uh, some, some funding and uh, support for that activities in ADB internally. So next question is to, I think as you, Rana, is still here, can you answer that one of the question was, your India, Mumbai you know, analysis, does that include feeder lines servicing? Right. So this, this really depends on, on the, the, the surveys that have been carried out. In the case of Mumbai, um, there was a household survey that was carried out by some researchers, which uh, asks very detailed information about uh, what, what types of uh, options are there. But if I come to, uh, you know, if I think about a big data source like uh, Google Maps, you know, where we're giving all sorts of queries, then in, in fact, for, for a number of cities, uh, when Google Map returns you some information, uh, it does uh, give you some sense of, you know, how much time it takes to walk or different options of, of getting to, let's say, from your home to a station or from the station to your place of work. So, uh, Kijun, it really depends. 
uh, on, on, on the source of the information that you're using, uh, whether, whether it's capturing the, the feeder information. My sense is that, you know, the informal, the, what, what we, the, really the informal kind of um, uh, systems that we uh, uh, use for public transport, um, maybe, maybe that's an issue in, in some of these big data sources. Okay. Over. Next question is about in a practical application of big data. Can this question to Dr. Zhang? And one of the question is, can big data analysis helps in removing bottlenecks in India's transport system like railways to reduce chronic delay and to make it more efficient like railways in Japan? So can, can you answer to that question? You are in a Expert on uh, I don't know, it's parents in India's railways, so... Yeah, but in general, in, uh, removing congestion in general. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it congests. Oh, we uh, in South Korea use uh, mobile phone data, use uh, conge the movement of the south areas to the local and the global uh, trends. So uh, sometimes use, uh, we, uh, so we can find the some areas where here the people move the many places in this airport. There's no the small change card users. So we can in this case we use find the where is the usage the transit public transit is usually so low. With in these areas we can go you know, can provide so many, many public transport and uh, uh, textures such so, so like public transport in use the county uh, to reduce congestion to this road port. It, it, it needs a general solution. Right, right, thank you. I think it is very much uh, what types of data you have, you can tackle congestion problems in yes. there. And I uh, have a, another question to uh, Gai Yanghu and uh, Sri Ganesh about you know, when, you, when you work on big data, especially mobile phone data, data or data involving personal data, you know, information, personal information. First rejection from the uh, many of the companies or uh, government is all privacy issues or data include private information. But you know, all data is anonymized and there will be no way you can trace individuals. So any, ex any comment on that? You know, Gayang, who you, from your experience, can you comment on the privacy issues? Sure, yes, it's an extremely common Sometimes you could say it's an excuse and sometimes it's a very valid reason for not sharing. Um, this is actually a big topic that we've been working on about data sharing. And you're right, uh, many companies, whether it's in government or agencies or you're talking about private operators, even though we, it's you know, in the light of social good, um, the whole privacy, especially the GDPR, um, has been in, in place, especially more so for European companies, but many companies who are not under Europe still look at the GDPR as an example or as a, as a you know, pinnacle stone. And what we, what we see that is, that is where um, the discussion we have been having about data sharing, that it needs to have a regulatory framework. Data is very, um, we once had a, a um, organization um, sharing, they feel that data sharing is like a minefield. It's, you don't know when you're going to step into a, a trap uh, because you don't know, even though yes, and um, data can be anonymized, but I think we have seen several cases um, where once you maybe combine data, that actually that anonymized data that can become quite identifiable. And that's what, that is what scares a lot of um, organizations. So we're really pushing to ask um, organize, uh, government authorities to work with each other as well as working within this public transport sector about data sharing and about having regulatory around data sharing because without such framework, the, the market is, is once was, uh, once expert once called was a wild, wild west. No, everyone is trading in a different way. Everyone is sharing in a different platform and different um, standards. And and this is going to be and this is becoming more and more important as as I as we all see that big data is becoming extremely important. So um, yeah, sorry. In short, is that yes, it's definitely a prevalent issue, um, and it seems like without any regulatory or any authorities helping to help with um, you know 
in some not to, it doesn't it doesn't have to be regulating but it has to at least to step in to look at that then um that will continue a lot of organization will continue to use privacy as a way to not share Sri Ganesh, do you have any comment on that privacy issues um, just some quick things. I think uh, Gaiang has covered uh, quite a few of these, right? I, I think we need to change also the conversation from, you know, is it about the removal of something going wrong or is it the minimization of potential harms, right? You can't have 100% um, um, that everyone seems to want and, and sort of, you know, the conversations in the external environment affect that. But there are ways of addressing these concerns in, in a responsible fashion that can really minimize harms. So Gaiang has talked about the, the regulatory frameworks to be able to share. The second question, and she had alluded to this under this category of excuses that are made sometimes because you know, you're not. There is also this question of how does one actually cost this? It's, it's seen as, as, as a valuable commodity, right? In, in the developed countries, you have the reseller markets have sufficiently matured, right, of, of aggregated data, which has sort of, you know, reduced. Um, and then thinking about this through different levels of uh, granularity of insights, right? I'm not interested to know what someone at number 12 Balcom Place is going, you know, there. It's, it's about in that, you know, 200, 300 meters, meter square region, you know, what are sort of mobility, you know, what level of granularity that you need. So there are more than enough ways of being able to do it. It's just that standards need to be established in, 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 in each country. Mm -hmm. I have a, I think where time is nearly up, but I have a very, very interesting question, important question, last question. How can big data on travel behavior of low income commuters be generated since they are more likely not to have smartphone or similar tracking information? Sri Ganesh? Yeah, I'd like to take this. And I think um, this leads back to that comment, I think, uh, in uh, Gaing's presentation about the bias, right? The data has certain bias. It doesn't capture every segment of society. But just because it has bias doesn't mean that you can't craft effective policies that can leverage this data and reduce cost. So let me give you an example in slightly different things that maybe not necessarily for, for transport, right? Um, you know, the Boston City Council, you know, some seven, eight years ago, you know, released an app called Street Pump, right? Which is a smartphone app that you turn on when you get into your car and you drive around and it uses the phone's accelerometer and gyrometer to figure out if it has run over a pothole and if it does it sends the gps coordinates back to the question of you know where is the efficient allocation of limited public resources i don't need to send trucks out to figure out where the, the where the potholes on the roads are people themselves are doing it by virtue of just driving around you can transplant that to Dhaka or Jakarta or Colombo and say, okay, will that work? You can say, well, you know, smartphone penetration in Colombo is about 30%, bit higher in, in, in Jakarta, uh, you know, somewhere around that 40, 45% in, in Delhi, right? And you might miss out the roads that are traveled by the poor, right? Now, one can look at that and say, then maybe I shouldn't use it. But the lack of a signal is also a signal. You can craft an effective public policy response by saying, I know where the roads are. These are the places where I am getting my signals from. And I send my trucks to the areas where, uh, where I'm not getting sufficient signal. So you can invert that to a transport example and say that you know, where you're not getting sufficient uh, information about in terms of transport from localities, et cetera, that's where I maybe deploy more customized on the ground surveys. So you can craft these nuanced uh, aspects to address these issues of bias, but first you need to know the bias and whether it changes over time. Thank you very much. I think we will close the Q&A session and thank you for all speakers, good presentations, insightful presentation and the all the participants asking good questions. We cannot cover all the questions, but I, we tried to cover most of the important questions. Bef and I, before I close, and uh, I will make a very short closing remark, and uh, there is an announcement, and all, all participants should, you know, I, 
I would like to ask you to stay. There is an announcement from ADB about uh, innovation challenge. It has very closely related to new uh, technology and uh, big data. I think in a, this session was very useful, not only, you know, I don't know how many people uh, um, find it useful. For myself, it was very useful. I, I work in the uh, big data area from the transport side, but still very useful. And uh, as I say, you know, data is data. It's a, an AI is tool, but what the, how you bring, bring the life into it is, depends on how you, how you manage it and how you, what your thinking is, what your vision is, what is the purpose of your uh, data analysis is. Also, my last message is that big data is not far away from us. It's already there. And how you make use of it in a good way, better way, and useful way is up to uh, everyone's decisions. I think that's my very short uh, final remark. Also, we have an announcement, very exciting an announcement about the uh, it's, uh, innovation challenge. It's called innovation challenge, uh, one of the initiative by ADB. It's very exciting. And, uh, the purpose is to get the good ideas from the audiences and any, any, any people in the ADB DMCs or uh, DMC counterparts, academia, anyone you can generate uh, your uh, ideas. So how it works in the, in the event app, we have a, a button, which is the, uh, what is the called challenge icon. Is innovation challenge icon in the presented in the web page. You can click it and you can register it. Then you can uh, address what is the biggest challenge facing the uh, transport sector. You can, you can uh, express yourself in you know, what is the most challenging transport problem to be solved. Then ADB will consolidate that's uh, information and bring it to uh, innovation challenge, uh, uh, what does I call it, uh, call it. Uh, we will request proposals to the, all the you know, academia or industry or private, even you know, individuals can do it. So we'll receive proposals. What is the innovative solutions? For, to tackling that problems. So if uh, successful, people, uh, the winner can get up to 500,000 US dollar for developing pilots or in a prototype or whatever solutions. So it's kind of an you know, open competition and uh, you, can, you can suggest your proposals. So I, I, I hope that all the uh, participants participate in the survey about, about the biggest challenge in the new transport sector. And then we can the, keep an eye on the announcement from ADP. There will be invitation to proposal for the, those challenging uh, items. Is it clear? <laughs> I hope I did make it clear. And uh, maybe I myself will challenge and pr propose something to get the 500,000 US dollar. <laughs> and I thank you everyone uh, for good presentations and all the, all the participants. We had about uh, over 200 something uh, participants. And uh, I hope this was useful session for everyone. I hope to see you next time. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Yeah, it was very, very nice. It turns out very nice and the questions were very, uh, very nice questions. And I think we need a more serious big data session runner. What do you think? Yes, yes. There's a, a, clearly a lot of interest on, on the big data. In fact, yeah. you know, we, we find, uh, you know, for the Philippines work, we find that the Google uh, mobility and this uh, uh, data it's giving very different results from the call detail records mm -hmm. uh, from the telcos. And one of the reasons might be because of what uh, one of the, uh, you know, the, the questions to the panel, mm. it was this issue that uh, uh, the, the fact is that um, 
Google Mobility requires not only that I have uh, a smartphone, mm. but that I have some Google app, uh, and it requires me to have the GPS locator on. Mm. Um, uh, and, and, and most people uh, here in the developing world, they will shut, even if they have a smartphone, they'll shut off the GPS locator because it eats up the um, internet time. Yeah. And, and, and we find from the call detail record, uh, because yep. that one is, is better in the sense that it's any phone. It can be that old style mobile phone. As long as you send a text, receive a text, it, it tracks you. The problem with that one is that the cell tower, the location yep. is not as accurate as a GPS. So there are these two trade-offs. So what we are proposing to Globe is let's do a very simple study, just mm. comparing these two sources. Yeah. And it'll be very useful for policymakers, as data scientists, et cetera, because we do need to understand some of the properties of this big data uh, better. So right. fully, fully agree. Yeah, I think, yeah. Yes. Yeah. No, I think, um, see, on, on the CDR side, there's one thing is the CDRs. There's also something called the VLRs. Mm -hmm. So because the CD, CDRs, it's event-based, so you need to have use phone versus VLR captures and the, and the resolution uh, things aside. But you know, the Google data in terms of how that is generated is a black box, yeah. right? It's also dependent on prior behavior, right? And it's doing some prediction about what is actually the num you know, sort of the number of, number of trips. So how that gets changed by, you know, I mean, I, I'm curious to really know with COVID-19 mm -hmm. and these trips that they're capturing about, you know, whether they're stay at home word or orders are, working or not, how it sort of differs from reality. Yeah. Um, and also my, my, my experience, I, was, I made an agreement. I made the telecommunication company to agree and government to agree to use the signal data, not the transaction data. Because mm. transaction data is very biased. Right. So yeah. especially in a big countries with a less population, how you can do the survey. I did about 15 years ago, I did the manual survey for Mongolia, 1,000 mm. kilometer highway. I dispatched people in the midpoint and they asked questions to the people because there are about 200 vehicles per hour or you know, less than 100 vehicles per hour in some uh, sections of the road. So it was possible, but if you have a mobile phone, that is easy. You know. So I, I think, you know, we can create some kind of you know, working group among us. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, yeah. I think it's a great idea. Yeah, it's yeah. a great idea. Also, you know, having some small fund for study or you know, research paper, you know, it's not a big deal in ADB, especially in pandemic, we cannot travel. We save lots of budget. <laughs> so <laughs> That's true. That's can true. Use it for more <laughs> mental journey, mental travel than the physical travel. Okay. So all agree to to have more in a further. I, 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 I totally agree. In fact, you know, VPKM had told me a couple of months back is exactly that, that why not have something on big data? Oh yeah, yes. Something. That was my work list, but I was so busy with the electric vehicles and some other things. So, right, right, yeah, right. so big data, because my target was how to, you know, make the most of the DMCs to utilize their mobile phone signal data. That was the most valuable data in transport. Because in, in Kazakhstan, I was supporting developing national transport model for the mm -hmm. country. Mm -hmm. So without all the metrics, you know, it doesn't work. Yeah. So right. let's, let's go, you know, I hope everyone can participate with your group. And so maybe any suggestion from, you know, you know uh, Gayang and uh, Ganesh and uh, Dr. Zhang will be very welcome. You know, we can, we can right. do some cooperative work and uh, partnership. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and looking forward, Kijin, we'll, we'll be in touch about this initiative. Right, right. We can meet uh, Shri Ganesh. As always, as always. Dr. Yeah. Jankin. Bye-bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.